next session. We have three exceptional uh, scholars, thinkers, people in our, in our panel. Uh, we will first hear from Mariana Cavalcanti, she speaks from Bairro Peixoto, Copacabana. co directs the program in uh, the, the laboratory in urban studies in the Fundação de Tulio Vargas, where she's also a professor of anthropology. We'll then hear from the banks of the Charles. Lawrence Rolf, who is in Anthropology and um, African American Studies at Harvard, and we are also very, very lucky to have with us as a discussant, uh, Alison Eisenberg, who is a uh, history professor and uh, an urban historian and co-director of Princeton's program in urban studies. So, embodied violence, life stories, dreams. I'd like to begin by thanking Bruno, thanking João, thanking Pedro, thanking Antonio, Antonio Sergio, and Lili, and everybody else that allowed me to be in this conference. And it's a it's, it really is a pleasure to be here. It's great to like be putting faces to bibliographical references, um, to be turning some bibliographical references into flesh and blood colleagues, and strengthening existing linkages. Thank you. So. Um, I specialize really on cities, and I've been trying for most of my life to try and take seriously this idea of an urban anthropology of the favelas of Rio rather than an anthropology of favelas. So I'm trying to think, I've always tried to think through the, uh, uh, the favelas in the, as part of the city, not as something that is set apart from them. So I'm really concerned with their constitution as an object of urban planning. And this speaks directly to the general theme of the conference health in the city, even more so to its subtitle, Differences, Difference, Rights, Belonging. So historically, the answer was really simple. You know, you had the favelas, like Bruno mentioned, like Mass, oh yeah, I'd also like to thank Massa for a wonderful talk earlier today that really sort of set the ground for this. And so it used to be very simple up until the 1960s and 70s when you had major removal programs. So the solution to the favela problem was to raise them. Right? Just raise them, not in the sense of raising them, but um, right? uh, um, destroying them. And you know, usually sending their residents out into um, very far away housing projects in the peripheries. But since the late 1970s, this has changed. Right? Um, and new elements of problems and solutions and new ways of constructing the favelas as problems and solutions to them as problems have been assembled and reassembled in distinct and shifting ways. So today I want, to talk to, uh, I want to talk about favela urbanization in the old industrial suburbs of Rio, right? In the larger context of Rio's reshaping in preparation for the World Cup and the Olympics. And I want to do this from an anthropological perspective. Um, so first argument is that over the course of the past two decades, favela urbanization and infrastructural upgrading have become institutionalized and legitimized in the public sphere as a response to the favela's domination by highly militarized drug gangs. In other words, it's because the favelas are violent that their, that their material infrastructure should be improved. So somewhat paradoxically, violence and the stigma attached to the favelas have also created the conditions for the residents' political recognition and some leverage while reproducing the stereotypes and power relations that reinforce the idea of their cultural alterity vis-a-vis -vis the formal city. I refer to this process as favela consolidation. In my dissertation and upcoming book, I trace the historicities and trajectories of favela consolidation by looking into the transformations in favela housing, the transition from the stucco shack to the brick and mortar houses that spared no efforts in producing safe spaces beyond the reaches of violent conflict. I argued that on an everyday level, favela consolidation is experienced as the ever precarious accommodation of often contradictory organizing forces, territorial logics, and modes of exercising sovereignty over particular stretches of urban space. Oh, I just wanted to show you this. <laughs> uh, daily life unfolds right in the interstices of the distinct territorializing efforts of uh, shaped simultaneously by the drug trade, by drug trade disputes, and by the eruptive presence of a violence, violent, corrupt police force, but also by increasing state investments, access to services, and the imagination of a more inclusive democratic order. 
And this in a decade, right, or the past decade, we've had a steady reduction in inequality levels, though Rio does lag behind the rest of the country in this reduction of inequality. So with Rio's successful bid to host major global events like the World Cup and the 2016 Olympics, these policies have considerably upscaled. Favela consolidation has turned into what I call pacification urbanism. The political, discursive, and imaginary construction of a city suited to host global events would inevitably, inevitably have to confront the public security crisis of the past three decades. And that crisis has coincided with the favela issue. Previous urbanization programs, like the favela Bayou of the, of the 1990s, put the favelas on official city maps and created the institutional routines for a notion of favela urbanization that included the provision of services such as health posts and daycare centers. Now it's a matter of inscribing the, no, now it is a matter of inscribing the, fa of inscribing the favelas in the urban landscape in a city that has lived off its paradisiac scenery for more than a century now. But I want to suggest that current infrastructural upgrading schemes constitute one aspect of a larger, of a larger project of pacification right, that is central to the city branding strategies currently reshaping Rio for the mega events of the coming years. Pacification here refers to the program launched by the state of Rio in late 2008. It consists in the permanent occupation of certain strategically located favelas. And these are the favelas. This, this is a bit outdated. We've got about 30 UPPs now, but it gives you a, a, a sort of a sense of the geography of the program, right, um, where the UPPs are established. In general, the favelas are initially occupied by the elite, uh, elite forces of the military police. Once territorial control is secured, special forces give way to recently graduated military police officers who become the representatives of law and order, thus anchoring the state and the favelas. Pacified favelas, i.e. those with UPPs, become the preferred sites for public and privately funded social programs and new improved legalized services. The spatial distribution of UPPs in the city leaves no doubt as to their privilege in the touristic sites, the elite south, south zone in particular, and the areas where the Olympic Games are to be held. Uh, beyond which, and, and this map is really curious because I got it off the UPP website, so the city still spreads out for roughly the same, ex you know, that last UPP is like halfway between the territorial boundaries of the city, so this is a very misleading map because it gives you the impression that they're spread out throughout the territory, but then you have like the largest neighborhoods in the city that have no UPPs. So, um, okay, uh, so beyond this pacified city, there's an invisible periphery that is increasingly fraught with high homicide rates and particularly among young black males. The UPP seals a new pact with the business sector through the establishment of public-private partnerships that enjoy what seem to be unlimited UPP funds. Pacification urbanism, which is, I am actually want to talk about recent interventions in the favelas, produces symbolically charged urban landscapes. Recent investments in favela infrastructures share three features. They emphasize the favela's scenery, they're visible from afar, they underline the connections or passages between the favela and the so-called formal city. They produce an ambiguous regime of favela invisibility, insofar as it's not the favela as such that is accentuated in the landscape, but the very spectacle of its integration into the city. Come back to that. This feature is particularly visible in the Oscar Maya designed pedestrian overpass that looms large at the western exit of the Zuzu Angel Tunnel that connects the consolidated elite south zone of the city to the, rest, to the western frontier. The overpass connects the Rocinha that has for decades been branded as the largest favela in Latin America to a massive sports center built to cater to the community. A similar effect is to be found on the hill that separates Rio's most famous beaches, Copacabana in Ipanema, where a massive elevator now connects the favelas that spill down the slopes to the subway station on General Osorio Square. Its futuristic design is highly visible from the beach and from most of the south zone of the city. But again, it obliterates the favela from the urban landscape thus produced. The gaze is drawn to the connection to an alleged model and discourse of favela integration into the city. Cable cars are particularly apt to illustrate the spectacle of favela integration into the city, while providing quaint views for the hordes of tourists that Olymp Olympic Rio is expected to draw. The model was initially attempted in Medellin and worked and was imported to Rio by the Paki Works 
urbanization project started in 2007. The first was inaugurated in 2011 in the Complex de Le Mans, and it already integrates the cityscape even for the tourists who do not venture out into this, out of the south zone, for it's visible from the Linha Vermelha, the expressway that connects um, the airport to the south zone of the city. This is the Linha Vermelha. The Linha Vermelha also cuts across the, com the favelas that comprise the Complexo da Maré, home to more than 100,000 residents, allegedly benefited with an acoustic um, barrier that is supposed to like keep the noise from the expressway um, to spill over into the, into the favela. Um, and this is a treatment that also blocks the Linha Vermelha's view of the favelas. The soundproof barrier proved even more incongruous once it was decorated with naive paintings um, with Brazilian popular culture motifs, among which figure the city's favelas. The barrier replaces the real favela with a romanticized dis depiction. However, if one, one's gaze moves beyond the acoustic barrier, the favela catches one, one's eye once again, now at a distance, sprawling at the foot of the cable car system that spreads across five different hilltops. Okay, this is it again. <laughs> um, more cable cars are to come. In the old favela of Providencia that Marcia showed us earlier on, um, dozens of removals and forced displacements have sparked protests and disputes by residents who suspect that the main use of the system will be for tourists to reach the hilltop, to gaze at the new scenery of the Porto Maravilha, as the urbanistic pro project for revitalizing the port is known. Dozens of houses that have stood atop the hill for decades have been literally marked for removal. In that, their owners come home one day to find the initials SMH, uh, that's the Municipal Secretariat of Housing, written on their facades. Um, at least two more favelas, Hossi and Borel, are also to receive their own cable car systems, despite serious critiques from residents and grassroots social movements that demand badly needed but aesthetically inv invisible sewage systems. In the new favela landscape under construction in the city, the UPPs come into play as landmarks are accentuated in the landscape, lit by night and brandished by day, um, in large panels that loom over the hill slopes, next to the shining colorful new housing projects and futuristic alternative transportation experiments. See the UPPs, and this, like, uh, so they build schools, and this is a particularly relevant school because this was a journalist that was killed in the Complex de Alemão that was, right, so you, it's like violence gets reinscribed in the cityscape, right, in the whole pacification effort. It, it becomes memorialized, right? You're never going to forget that Chimo was killed in the Complex de Alemão. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, the UPP buildings are also highly visible from the formal city, this also pacifying the anxieties of the middle classes that for more than two decades um, witnessed cost, constant shootouts and perceived themselves as uh, virtual victims of the drug gangs. The UPP signs remind the favela's neighbors of the marvels of pacification. So now I want to turn to one particular area of the city that um, are the, uh, golden, uh, the northern industrial suburbs. I know there's a lot of you that are familiar with Fiocruz, so I'm talking particularly about Manguinhos, that has acted for a very long time as a lab for Fiocruz, right? So in the north industrial suburbs, the aesthetics of pacification urbanism take on a distinct shape and scale. Here it's not a matter of, find, of finding a spot for colorful versions of favelas in the cliché snapshots of the city, but of remaking vast expanses of space erected according to the logic, scales, and aesthetics of industrial activity. And of course, a lot of this land is also contaminated. It is no accident that so-called mm -hmm. favela complexes spread on the margins of this industrial zone. They thrived in connection, historically, to the plentiful supply of industrial jobs. But closer examination of the region's history shows that many of the communities here are themselves the result of formal state practices and programs. In the industrial suburbs, Favelas often originate from projects constructed in short-lived housing programs or as provisional housing that endures and consolidates. Yet others come from informal occupations of private or publicly owned land. The 1990s witnessed the construction of several housing projects in the region, many of which have been transformed to the extent that the original architecture of the buildings has been lost in what is usually referred to as a favelization process. Favelization. In short, the favelas of the old industrial suburb tell non-canonical stories of public policies vis-a-vis -vis the favelas in the 20th century. Far from the space in which, from which the state is absent, 
The industrial zone can be read as a laboratory for low-income housing policies for most of the 20th century. The latest chapter in the non-canonical tale of Rio's public housing policies consists in the refunctionalization of old abandoned industrial sites into housing projects. And this is one that just got, was imploded in January 2012. Coca-Cola, Poesie, Schkol, Kibon are names that refer respectively to soda, lingerie, beer, and ice cream brands once manufactured along the train tracks. Others are, are, are under construction. They all name favelas now, right, or projects. In the adjacent neighborhood of Jacarezinho, no less than 80 former factory sites are marked for similar refunctionalizing urbanization projects. Here, I, so this all amounts to, right, here a new city is under construction under the, age, the aegis of pacification urbanism. That milk factory ruin, the one that I showed in the picture before, stands next to a former de army deposit plot where additional 400 housing units were delivered in 2010. On the other side of the train tracks, 2000, the 2,000 unit Bairro Carioca also brought in newcomers and families relocated from floods and other favela urbanization schemes. They, they, in, in this Bairro Carioca, this is where people get, uh, uh, all, all, the, all the people removed from risk areas throughout the metropolitan region are being thrown in here. Um, there's no provision for mixed use in these areas. All this amounts to rows and rows of four floor buildings of 42 square meter apartments over a vast expanse of urban space. And the conclusion of these works seems to be ever deferred. In a word, pacification urbanism produces a sense of impending change. <coughs> because, you know, it, 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 there's all this transformation, right? This physical transformation of space going on. Uh, but the change that never seems to come to term. And as the new landscapes are ridden with ruins and debris, thus thus cementing uncertainty. One year after the first housing units were delivered, many displayed cracks. They poorly withstand the heavy summer rains. Several apartments on the top and ground floors of these apartments, uh, of these buildings, were severely flooded in most summer rains. Ironically, many of the residents had been located from, uh, from flood-prone risk areas. But predictably, as was the case in the housing projects of the 1970s, Ground floor apartments of many of these buildings have been co converted into businesses. The drug trade has also taken territorial control of the projects. In the favelas, negotiations over disappropriations seem to follow random pa patterns. It is often the case that few houses remain along stretches of demolished ruins. Those who remain among the, among the ruination tend to accept any sort of compensation in order to escape the derelict land, landscape surrounding them and the rats. Amid the piles of debris, sometimes one can catch a glimpse of the remaining walls of former kitchens with the carefully placed decorated tiles once carefully chosen by their former owners and paid for by many hours of work. In other words, if favela urbanization in and of itself is nothing new, the piling up of this type of scale of urbanization project with the UPP program in the city at large amounts to an experience of ongoing and future transformations on an, and this idea of future transformations on an unprecedented scale. They produce a sense of impending change. The UPP program matters here because it places change on the horizon of an everyday that has been for decades now constituted by routine uncertainty. Residents have for, lived for years on end in the expectation of the next shootout the next police incursion, the next glimpse of violence down an alley bend. Now the sources and meanings of daily uncertainty have shifted. People don't know if they're gonna get to keep their homes. And while daily life endures ridden with us, as ridden with uncertainty as ever, and very little changes despite the proliferation of debris <coughs> from construction work that has been ongoing for more than three years, the juxtaposition of the spatial transformations of the PAC and the UPP produce a sense of anticipation. Thus, the spectacle of favela integration into the cityscape and the reshaping of industrial rooms into a new city of colorful housing projects are but a, ha but a fraction of all the changes that the city is experimenting. But they're, they're but residual effects of much larger investments in mega structures and infrastructural works. Subways and expressways, the port, the region where the Olympic Park and the lodging of athletes is to be built, the list could go on but they poignantly capture the sense of anticipation that has been cast over the city at large. Amid old and new ruins, Rio's residents wait 
for change that seems to bring more, more of the same. Thank you. I just wanted to start by thanking Joelle Bell and the other organizers of the conference um, for inviting me to Princeton and giving me this opportunity to share my work. Um, the talk that I will give today is an excerpt from my forthcoming book entitled Renegade Dreams, Living Through Injury in Gangland Chicago. In it, I examine the problem of gang violence in a low-income African-American neighborhood called Eastwood. Today I will explore the dialectic between injury and aspiration in Eastwood by discussing how I was introduced to the community and the relationships I, for, I forged within it. If I could distill my time in Eastwood down to a single ethnographic event, that scene would probably begin at a high school assembly on gang violence. There, Justin Cohn tilted in his wheelchair delicately balancing himself. He executed the move effortlessly while craning his neck to take in the audience behind him. Surveying the teenagers, Justin's neck muscles began to bulge. It was the winter of 2008, and 27 public school students had been killed since September, at the time an unprecedented number. Little did Justin know that the bloodshed would only increase. Tragically, beginning in 2008, the annual number of Chicago public school student deaths would be surpassed year after year after year. By the end of 2011, three years later, 260 would be dead. At the assembly, I sat with Justin, who'd encouraged me to attend. There was something remarkable about these speakers, he promised. I soon discovered what Justin meant. Like him, the young men on stage were former gang members who had been disabled by a gunshot. Now they were calling attention to their wounds. Watch this, Justin said, directing my attention to the stage. They're about to make folks really uncomfortable now. The disabled ex-gang members I saw were holding plastic bags and medical tubing. Soon they started to explain in precise and graphic detail the daily realities of life in a wheelchair. Realize, realizing that the men were holding catheters and enema bottles, the teenage audience began to squirm. Justin shot me and I told you so look. The men on stage calmly segued from medical necessities to larger truths. Their bodies now bear witness to violence, a violence that can and should be prevented. They say when you gang bang, when you drug deal, the outcomes are either death or jail. Tony, one of the disabled speakers said, you never hear about the wheelchair. And if you think about it, it's a little bit of both worlds because half my body's dead literally. From the waist down, I can't feel it, I can't move it, I can't do nothing with it. The rest of it's confined to this wheelchair. This is my prison for the choices I've made. In Chicago, the disabled gang member emerges as a prominent figure. He highlights the sobering realities of coming of age in a poor community under a persistent cloud of violence. After listening to the members of the Crippled Footprint Collective, I began to see the novelty of what disabled ex-gang members in Chicago were doing. Anti-violence forums like the one Justin and I, and I attended revealed aspects of the gang experience scarcely mentioned in ethnographic studies of street gangs. Contemporary scholarship fails to acknowledge that victims of gun violence are much more likely to be disabled than killed. Chicago is a prime example of this trend. Over the past 15 years, Eight, over 8,000 people have been killed, while more than 36,000 have been otherwise debilitated. Sitting behind Justin at the high school assembly, I was unaware of such statistics. I also didn't realize that hearing the Crippled Footprint Collective would inspire Justin to pursue a new career path. Soon after the talk, he decided that he wanted to become an anti-violence activist. Justin was already working at a violence prevention agency, Safe Futures. Now he was motivated to learn the craft of public speaking. His goal was to tell his story to gang-affiliated youth in Chicago and eventually start a violence prevention agency of his own. I've never been more sure about anything in my life, he told me a few weeks after the assembly. That conversation came at the beginning of what would be three years of ethnographic fieldwork. As I spent time with Eastwoodians like Justin, I saw firsthand how injury invaded people's lives. <clears throat> 
Residents there interpreted injury on a broad spectrum, one that forced me to stop thinking of the concept as an objective condition a doctor could identify and diagnose. Instead, I began to think of the myriad injuries that East Whittians described as encumbrances following them through life and affecting their future prospects. Each time I listened to a teenager explain the pressures he felt to seek retribution after a close friend was killed, or heard former gang members recount the stories about being gunned down and left for dead, I immediately noticed proof of injury, bodies that had been partially immobilized, futures that seemed destined for pain and disappointment. Then I noticed the bulging necks and fierce eyes of East Whittians as they told me their stories, bodies that despite their injuries weren't slunk or broken, but upright and inspires, upright and inspired. Minds that despite terrible odds weren't co-signed to a life of drudgery, but were busy planning for the future. To be clear, the people I lived with did not speak from a position of institutional authority. They knew no one except for maybe green graduate students cared much about their dreams. Nevertheless, East Whittians, young and old, male and female, dreamed in ways that expressed desires for a different world. To be sure, their dreams weren't grandiose. In fact, when I first moved into Eastwood, I did not recognize residents' struggles as dreams because they seemed quite banal. Safe passage to school, stable housing, an affordable, livable job. These dreams, it should be noted, did not always come true. Children were gunned down on the way to school. Adults searched for work to no avail and the threat of displacements haunted residents daily. In the face of these hardships, the scant resources that East Whittians did obtain barely scratched the surface of actual need. Still, the brutal honesty with which they acknowledged the diff difficulty of real change suggested that the power of such dreams is in having them and working towards them, regardless of whether or not they come to fruition. Before long, I began to understand that in Eastwood, injury endows dreams with a renegade quality. In my broader work, I define a renegade dream as an aspiration rooted in an experience of injury, which reimagines the possibilities within injury. Given this description, Justin would be the perfect example of such a rebellious dreamer. Soon after he and I saw the Crippled Footprint Collective, he began to hone his public speaking skills. Once a week in Justin's living room, I watched as he tenuously gathered together details about his upbringing. These he folded into a narrative that led to the night he was shot. Week after week, he recited his story, one centered on the Eastwood gang he grew up in. I joined up and I never really thought twice about it, Justin said. It was February and he was practicing his speech. It seemed like I was where I should be because a lot of my friends and family they were all involved in the gang, so it wasn't anything new. But after a while, when my friends started to die, I noticed that I was surrounded by violence more and more. Justin's cousins and uncles, his father and grandfather, all belonged to the Divine Knights, a street gang that has controlled Chicago's west side for over a half century. Listening to him articulate the meaning of loss awed me. As Justin funneled a history of gang involvement into a narrative focused on a single violent event. He transformed the way I thought about the community and the Eastwoodian response to the most intimate of injuries. In the living room of Justin's Greystone apartment, we forged a reciprocal bond. Not only were our sessions a chance for Justin to practice for the day when he too might address a crowd of high schoolers, they were also an invaluable opportunity for me to hear another perspective on my field notes. Justin had lived in Eastwood his entire life and had belonged to the Divine Knight since he was 14. As such, he was a reliable counsel. By the spring of 2008, Justin and I were so pleased with the progress we were making on our respective, pro on our respective projects that we told other longtime East Whittians about our Thursday afternoon sessions. Over the next two years, a number of different East Whittians visited Justin's house. Ms. Dickerson and Ms. Pearl stopped by to, to strategize an effective protest against the city's plan for redevelopment. Tamara Anderson and Mr. Otis came over to brainstorm ideas for building a museum that showcased the Divine Knight's civil rights roots. And Amy O'Neill appeared on several occasions to practice delivering her story about coping with HIV. I learned a great deal about the everyday struggles of my neighbors and, just as importantly, 
Witness the openness and support of a community that was battered, but far from beaten. The input of these East Woodians helped Justin craft his message. In turn, his evolving narrative helped each of the session's attendees, myself included, with our respective projects. For example, Justin's discussion of the ties between the Divine Knights and his family made Miss Pearl reconsider the language of gang violence being employed by city planners, language that disregarded the bonds of kinship. For Mr. Otis, the focus on disability triggered nostalgia for a time when the Divine Knights were more politically and less violently inclined. Thanks to this kind of collaboration, Justin was able to layer his speeches with a broader political implication. Specifically, he began to understand how the allure of a drug economy transformed the gang's collective outlook away from social action and towards profit making. Gang elders like Mr. Otis held out hope that a political gang, one that once played a constructive role in the community, could reemerge. For both Mr. Otis and Justin, the gang wasn't something that could realistically be eradicated. Therefore, they were interested in harnessing its potential towards a political end. I began to see that their orientation towards the inner city's social problems could enrich the perspective of many local experts who came to Eastwood to understand urban poverty. In 2007, not long after I began volunteering at Safe Futures, I met Aaron Smalls. He was the commissioner of the city's Department of Planning and was visiting local nonprofits as part of what he called a scouting trip. Shortly after Mr. Smalls' visit, I scheduled a meeting with him at his office at City Hall, where he, ex where he explained the local government's interest in redeveloping Eastwood. Mr. Small stated that the area was, quote, doomed for failure because residents lacked the basic skills and qualifications to secure livable wages. Though I didn't agree with his interpretation of doom, it was certainly true that of the 41,768 residents living in Eastwood, nearly half, 42%, fell below the poverty line. Those who are employed, Mr. Small said, often find themselves in repetitive, low-wage jobs or without jobs altogether." End quote. At nearly 51%, Eastwood's unemployment rate was three times higher th than the rest of Chicago and five times higher than the national average. Mr. Small continued, with the large population of ex-offenders, who often struggle with drug addiction, poverty, low rates of education, unemployment, and unstable housing, East Woodians simply don't have the necessary resources to improve their community. In my notebook, I underlined this statement. Mr. Small's perspective on the community diverged from the beliefs of the community itself. The facts about Eastwood were not under dispute. 34% of residents aged 18 to 24 years lacked the high school diploma and 57% of all Eastwoodians were in some way involved in the criminal justice system, in jail, on parole, or on house arrest. It wasn't the statistics, but the interpretation that provided the basis of disagreement. Prior to interviewing Mr. Smalls, I had logged many hours in Eastwood, watching residents pursue future lives they imagined for themselves. These residents, I observed, did not deny being injured by a host of social forces from redevelopment to the heroin trade to jail. Rather, they considered their experience of injury a, fun, a foundational component of their worldview. The gaping statistical deficits were part, but only, uh, but only a small part, of who they were. Indeed, I saw that the statistical snapshots used by government officials to make quantitative sense of the inner city did more to cloud my understanding of Eastwood than enhance it. Scavenging for responses to Mr. Small's assessment of Eastwood as an isolated neighborhood, a neighborhood devoid of resources necessary for it to flourish, I was hardened by scholars who offered a different perspective on the organizing principles and capacities of urban communities. Philippe Bourgois, for example, has studied drug dealers in the pursuit of a difficult kind of dignity, sandwiched between the criminal justice system that targets them for detention and employees that regard them as bereft of moral virtue. These residents dwell in troubled, often forgotten outposts where the 1950s promise of industrialization became a 1980s junkyard of dreams, as Mike Davis calls it. In this wasteland, <coughs> gangs package narcotics to stimulate the local economy, taking it on themselves to bear responsibility for job growth and government-neglected streets. 
as Sidir Venkatesh has shown. These scholars have brought to light what residents separating the inner city from mainstream America have missed. The mutually reinforced tensions between local communities and their broader historical and social context. They emphasize factors big and small that make certain areas marginal. In so doing, they offer a more accurate accounting of the complex mix of both causes and symptoms that constitute the inner city's ills. Like Bourgois, Davis, and Venkatesh, I began to hone my approach, my own narrative of broad social historical transformations and the daily manifestations of those decades long changes. But I noticed that most scholars addressing inner city isolation were referring to re urban residents disconnected from neighborhood institutions and opportunity and opportunities in the legal labor market. I finally realized that I couldn't understand Eastwood through the frame of isolation alone. There, gang members weave in and out of community institutions such as juvenile detention centers. HIV positive teenagers and drug addicts are connected to government sponsored churches and dilapidated houses trigger tax incentives that spark citywide economic investment. I began to see that the very same historical factors that have spawned a theory of isolation Everything from high unemployment and crime, to the loss of manufacturing jobs, to the evacuation of the middle class, serve to remind us now that the ills of the inner city are inextricably linked to the ills of a global economy. The prevalence of anti-poverty programs, the drug trade, mass incarceration, and the growing tide of gentrification are all signs that life in Eastwood is both isolated from and burdened by the rest of the country. I wondered if I could supplement a theory of isolation with other, more fluid concepts. Initially, I was enamored with anthropological approaches to governance. With the focus on the practices of government, I could see Eastwood as a community in transition, politically and culturally. When development seemed a profitable possibility, government officials like Mr. Smalls drafted legislation that emphasized social reform. The language of that legislation made the uncritical socioeconomic label of the urban poor seem normal in the eyes of local government. They, in turn, mobilized institutional missions aimed to measure, diagnose, count, and contain gang members, all in the name of uplifting the community. Similarly, a focus on the social forces that normalize disease, disability, and premature death for urban residents place Eastwood's drug problem on a macro scale. In examining the mass incarceration of dealers and users, it was clear that the 1980s war on drugs was directly influenced by a bankrupt local economy and a failing public school system. Together, these factors funneled risk for incarceration and infectious disease into Eastwood. Over time, instead of examining the ways that these broader social forces constricted the life choices of Eastwoodians, many community leaders came to see these inequitable social conditions as inevitable. Were I content to paint a picture of Eastwood in broad brushstrokes, these theories would have more than sufficed. To be sure, they proved indispensable in helping me comprehend generally the problems of urban poverty. But it wasn't the general I was after. The general just didn't do justice to the relationships I was forging on the ground. To honestly articulate the experiences my neighbors offered, I needed to augment larger structural processes with the nuanced accounts of Eastwoodians' lives the way they moved through and made sense of them. The way Justin deployed his life story was a prime example. Indeed, his method, which involved exploring the social cost of gang violence, set him apart from a number of gunshot survivors that I would later meet in Chicago, who hoped to transcend the designation of disabled so that others would regard them as normal. Justin didn't try to attain some elusive conventional standard. He didn't want to leave his past behind. He dwelled in a space between life and injury and wasn't attempting to escape. Realizing that I had to myself get comfortable in this ambiguous space, I wanted my work to grapple with, uh, with what Eastwoodians already knew. I wanted to conduct the kind of research that did not exclude ambivalence and historical indeterminacy, but in, and in so doing found a point of departure in the murkiness of everyday life. I came to re Eastwoodians, I came to realize, were constantly plotting futures that demonstrated the inner city's connections to broader social worlds. Seen bottom up, the hustling and dancing, the trading and occupying of street corners, the fighting in urban strife, 
The details of urban life often viewed in terms of death or paralysis, sometimes physical, sometimes social or spatial, can, can be seen instead of in terms of collective and individual striving. From the bottom up, in other words, the underside of injury is revealed. My years in Chicago gave me access to gang leaders and grandmothers, pastors and HIV patients, drug addicts and school administrators, inmates and scholars. Hearing their perspectives helped me connect to an ambiguous space, a space in which past injuries are retold in the present to help shape possible futures. And the most tremendous aspect of this emergent history is what it creates, a radical refraction illuminating the ways in which Eastwoodians shift their bodies, crane their necks, and transform injury into another way to dream. Thank you. Well, thank you for those two terrific papers. What I'd like to do is offer some observations and themes that uh, some of you may want to take up for discussion. Um, so first, I'd like to draw attention to the use of the uh, medical metaphors and the health metaphors. I, I think uh, Bruno uh, brought those up this morning at the beginning of the day. Um, and I want to particularly signal what uh, Lawrence is doing that to me is entirely original. And that's taking the more uh, the cliched history of uh, the medical metaphor of um, often put through the terms of urban renewal or um, various other kinds of, uh, of public health policies that talk, for example, about the surgery of the city and um, the clogging of the arteries of traffic, the strained heart of the, of the downtown. And highlight here, I have never heard anybody turn that around and use the idea of injury and all of its possible meanings from the point of view, from any point of view to begin with, but, but particularly from the point of view of the, of the neighborhood itself. So I think that, for me at least, I, I was really struck by. Um, the, the second theme that comes out that I, I feel is implicit in maybe a little more implicit in both papers, but maybe more explicit in yours, is how any kind of organized or disorganized neighborhood activity can easily be cast as either violent or political. And I think, you know, you're, it's, uh, you know, hey, the American Revolution. <laughs> I'm teaching that in one of my urban history courses. Uh, and it, it's hard not to draw attention to that, um, you know, the, the kind of slippage and when the, the history of the gang's political origins and less violent origins um, is there's an effort to retrieve that from the, the senior uh, leadership. Um, so third would be how in both of your papers the topic of redevelopment and urban renewal is so prevalent. Um, it's so obvious in Mariana's. It's the organizing theme of top-down urban renewal and the power of the state to clear and remake um, but it's also right there behind the redevelopment um, officer, the city planning officer of Aaron Smalls, who basically says Eastwood is right for redevelopment because the citizens don't have enough resources. But it's a cliche in you know, modern US planning thought that, uh, that Robert Moses lost, you know, that Jay Jacobs won. And I think that this draw, puts front and center the fact that you know, urban redevelopment and any kind of, whether, you know, who is the state? I think that's a question to think about in um, Lawrence's paper, the state is, is actually Aaron Smalls, uh, you know, one representative, but, but representing city government. And then in Mariana's paper, the state, to me, as I'm a U.S. historian, is, you know, it's a little vaguer, but that, that maybe if you could bring that out a bit more and, and help us draw those comparisons. Um, and uh, then also the idea of what kind of measurements are used to assess and justify these policies. Uh, Lawrence's uh, paper referred to the statistics and the ways in which they're interpreted. But that, again, you know, I'm coming from the classroom this week, and it strikes me as I, you know, the students are figuring out whether they're ethnographers, you know, whether they're data folks, whether they're, you know, who, who are they, you know, kinds of tools are they going to use, it strikes me that that's also 
implicit in both of your stories, that question of what tools are people using today to justify the decisions that they're making. And that contrasts really powerfully with the idea of um, dreaming, you know, that that's a kind of tool. Uh, that's a kind of a resource. So, you know, but what are what you know? What are the tools? Is it statistics? Is it language of blight and obsolescence? Um, what what is the language and the the the, um, the tools that are used? Um, then I'm also struck for both of again as a historian, I'm struck in both of these papers of the tension between this really familiar long term history of poverty, unemployment, shelter crisis. Um, state intervention and the way that it intersects with you know these more particular um, small historical moments and that's uh, you know that's something that we see in the in Eastwood in in Lawrence's paper but is a is a little more elusive for Mariana and I think there like you left us with the image of the um, of the residents waiting you know waiting for what what next. So it's maybe worth asking, um, you know, in some cases, waiting is very much a political act. You know, I, there's, there's a, a poem, Coney Island of the Mind, that uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti wrote in the 60s, I am waiting. And it's just saturated with all the ironies of, um, of the conflicts of the contemporary culture in an incredibly, you know, political mode, but the, the refrain was, I am waiting, and it could be read as a passive kind of, you know, clearly that's the way he intended it. It could be read as passive, but he was investing it with all of this activism. Um, and so one of the questions I think is, you know, what, are, what does it mean that the residents are, um, are waiting? And um, then I think that that uh, would take me to my my last kind of general question and comment, which was uh, brought to mind with the um, the introduction this morning that uh, Marcia Castro made in talking about the rise of the idea of isolation as a way in the, you know the 19 teens of uh, kind of condemning an entire well like all of rural Brazil I guess you know that as being separate and having manifested a kind of illness that was rampant but important because it, it wasn't observed and it wasn't seen by the others you know, in the cities. And so similarly, it strikes me that that question of, um, of, so that struck me as a kind of, I had thought about the idea that isolation is also a medicalized metaphor. And so I, I you know, it's a, you know, it's a kind of urbanist metaphor, you know, the, the uh, as you point out, Mariana, with like the bridge over into the isolated favela, the questions of visibility, and you take right head on the, um, the question of uh, how isolation is or isn't interpreted. But I hadn't thought of it as also having very, it must, I mean, the thinking of it must be also in many ways a, a medical concept of, with its own weight, you know, just like, the terminology of experimentation has become so general in our culture that we might forget that it has origins in scientific practice, laboratory work. You know, and, and um, similarly, I think that that idea of isolation is might, we might have been, the urbanists might have overlooked the way in which that term, you know, isolation has its own kind of medicalized history that may or may not be relevant. Um, so those were some thoughts and things. Well, thank you, all three of you. That's fantastic. So let's actually hear, hear your responses. But in the meantime, I'll take down names for, for questions once we open up. I'd like to thank Allison for these great comments, and it's. And I'd also like to thank Lawrence for his paper because I, I I've always found like um, comparing the situation in Rio with Chicago and to be something that is extremely prolific that really helps us think through. Also, it's a matter of uh, how 
how we construct, you, you know, and I think this, this has been something that we've been talking about all day, you know, this idea of these uh, poor areas of the city and how there's an, an entire language that, you know, has been used to describe it and that has been used to, in, in the last instance, when describing the situation that has always been productive of solutions, right? It's like when you describe what, what sort of a problem is, what kind, what kind of neighborhood it is, you're already prescribing sort of um, the interventions that um, these areas are subject to. So um, I want to, uh, I think that one of, one of the most important issues here would be this matter of, I mean, at least as far as my paper is concerned, this idea of waiting, right, and the political implications of waiting. And I think I, I, I didn't make it that clear, but I think that in, in Rio these days, we're all, we've got this 2016 deadline that sort of paralyzes everybody. Because it's like we're all like building up to this Olympic, to these Olympics, and it's like it's like this disaster, like this chronicle of disaster foretold in a way, and uh, 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 and that it, it sort of congeals things, right? We it, I don't think that anybody's really able to think beyond 2016, and I think that that is a real problem because we've got all sorts of policies being developed and implemented that affect people's lives, and that affect the city, and that affect the future of the city. And it's all thought of in this very um, short-sighted time frame, right? What's going to happen after 2016? I mean, and as part of my um, more militant activity that has nothing to do with academia, one of the things that I've been trying to do is to, uh, uh, um, to oh, and this is an NGO that we found last year, but we're trying to think through what are the proposals for Rio after 2016, right? We're trying to uh, um, take up the political discussion of the city and of investments and what's going on and trying to move it beyond 2016, right? Because this is a, it's, it's a time frame that sort of, uh, uh, um, you know, it keeps us tied because you can't really think long term. And I think that in a way that only really makes it, uh, um, only renders more legible the fact that public policy, you know, uh, uh, tends to be um, project oriented these days. And that's a very different temporality from what we were used to thinking when we were talking about, for instance, uh, um, urban remodeling at the, at the beginning of the century, right? When you're trying to think of construction, uh, constructing a great city for the future and everything. And now it just seems that we're all trying to avoid disaster more than anything else, more than having a, you know, something more positive. So I think, I think that's, uh, I think that's very important to highlight, and I think that in Rio, in particular, the sense of waiting has to do uh, uh, with that. You know, because people feel that like, like that change is coming, that change has already happened, but it's like, what's going to happen after 2016? What's going to happen after 2016? No, it seems that we, we can't really dream or think or conceive anything that goes beyond 2016. So I say um, that's. That's that's uh, one important uh, aspect of, of you know of this conversation here, and the second point I'd just like to very briefly uh, address is this idea of isolation. I think you're right, uh, but in the case of Rio, I think what's so interesting is that we've been we, we were used to uh, to thinking about inequality and poverty in terms of this favela formal city divide. And what I, I think, when you look at a big map like that, and when you look at the way resources are being spent, within or without the or outside the Olympic project, is that you know uh, um, inequality and social segregation are, are, are way more complex than this divide, right? And that we're we're talking about uh, uh, a metropolitan region that is increasingly invisible in the light of the investments in a very limited area of the city. That you know, so this idea of waiting and this idea of the Olympics produces right um, a new regime of visibility and invisibility and a new periphery, and you know, so it's also recasting inequality on a different scale. Um, first, I'd just like to thank Allison for comments. Really, really great, and uh, really made me think about again, like the intersection between two of our papers. Um, I, I guess I'll take on the first, and in a way, the last question about metaphors of the city, and in particular, this notion of isolation. And I, for me, I think, I think for both of us, actually, this idea of isolation is also 
related to an idea of contagion, and that's how it becomes medicalized, because um, there's also an, an idea that kind of violence is gonna seep out of these low-income pockets, right, and pervade other areas, and that's why it needs to be contained, or that's why it needs to be redeveloped, or that kind of, need, that's why people need to be relocated or something like that. So in the idea of isolation, there's a kind of accusation about who should be feared and who should be protected from that fear, and oftentimes people within particular pockets, of course, are the ones who are seen as the ones that should be feared, right? And that, re and that relates to the question of whether something is violent or political and for whom, right? And I think that for me, I really, I studied, I worked with a gang that's been around for over 50 years, and so there's multiple generations of the gang, right? And so, right, so the notion of historicity becomes important. And for the oldest members, the, if you're 70 years old in Chicago and you're still claiming gang affiliation, it's because <laughs> you're, you're, you're saying that you believe that there should be a particular type of gang, right? Not a gang that conducts violence, but a gang that is political with a capital P, right? And so there's a kind of effort to memorialize that history of a political gang, memorialize what the gang has done in the past in order to say that gangs don't always have to be like this, gangs don't always have to be violent, right? And so that notion of the violent and political is very intertwined, right, Chicago? And as far as the role of the government, it's interesting around this idea of redevelopment as well because the residents I was working with were really not only kind of dismantling statistics or something like that, but looking at governmental categories, right? So they had the redevelopment plan for their neighborhood. They had the criteria by which a house was um, characterized as dilapidated. And they had the list of those houses that were, that were in the plan. And so they went around to those different houses and took pictures of them and kind of scrutinized what they mean and where they're positioned in relation to Kind of, kind of commercial outlets, and, and, and they were saying, you know, what makes this house dilapidated uh, versus another house? Like, this house is perfectly fine. So for them, another category emerged, which is the perfectly fine house, right? <laughs> and so they took these kind of blow-up pictures of perfectly fine houses to the hearing where the kind of redevelopment plan was going to be discussed and said that these, these categories are presumed to be objective, but they're very subjective, right? And they, and there's a kind of aspect of that that has to do with, you know, trying to relocate <coughs> certain people and trying to dismantle the neighborhood, and it's not called for, right? So, so well, let's let's collect a few uh, questions and then give them back. So, okay. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness, it was so wonderful to hear the two papers. And I could see everybody so intently listening to them. And I think it just reminded me why I love anthropology and, <laughs> <laughs> and why I'm so hopeful for ethnography in theory and in public debate. So it's probably wonderful to, to, to hear you both and, and to see the story of the city thinking with those materials, you know. And, uh, and, and, and I also want to go back to something that Allison mentioned, the bird's eyes view which is something that anthropologists should do, and you do it beautifully, it's fantastic. And I think what I, what I would like to hear more is like the, the finance, the money that goes to this. Where does it come from? Why, you know, who is financing all this? Where does it come from? And how does that tell us something else about city versus regional state versus federal government? You know, how is the city, with the money that it collects, it gets, changing the relationship between these various levels of government, you know, so so so, so some of that bird eyes view. But I also would like to get back to Alison's uh, point for you. What about people's gain? What are people gaining mm -hmm. through this? Are they gaining uh, real estate value through this in their favelas? You know, all of a sudden, does their shack get more value 
all of a sudden they have cash somehow if they were to sell that. You know, so, it's, so the, what are the gains that people have? And I think the third question then is, what about introducing some of Lawrence's ambiguity in the Birdite's view of the people? Mm -hmm. You know, what about if people themselves are seeing each other differently because of these new interventions? Maybe class appears more, because once you go above, you see that one shack have a, has a swimming pool, mm -hmm. and it's, yeah. has some kind of sanitation, whereas the whole chunk has not, you know? So, so, so if you could think about how this also highlights difference within favela and among the poor, you know, themselves. And I think for, uh, for Lawrence, it's just uh, very, very poignant, it's just wonderful to hear you tell the story and go back to this, and, uh, and, and, and I was stricken by how a similarity with what Keith said yesterday. When you were criticizing you know, the injury or the concept work that people do with the injury, how it does not fit in the statistics, right? That frames you know, arguments over investments or, or what should be done, et cetera, et cetera. It reminded me when Keith said, okay, they came with their own definition from Ghana, right? They had a different way of speaking of pain. And somehow they were reowning that they had diagnosed it in a different way and the diagnosed encompassed something else besides the biomedical, right? And I, and I think my question to you is a little bit, how, how do the people who work in this environment, you know, the churches you mentioned, the NGOs, do they get some of this conceptual ability that people are developing, this dreaming out of injury? Can they harness that into the kind of work they do? And how could then this work, and then pushing Mariana to your paper, how can that be scaled up at a broader level besides those Mr. X, Mr. Y, you know, who are, you know, dedicated there? How can that scale up to a policy level and to a city level? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so let's hear three more, and then we'll send it back to you. Yeah, that was already. What's your picture? What's your I like the paper really very much. I have a, a question for, for Mariana. I mean, living in Rio, uh, every day we hear that word pacification. And I mean, I have worked with indigenous peoples, and this, this word, when, when I hear pacification, I yes. think about Rondon, I think about if the die necessary but never to kill, I think about, I mean, this. this how we cover, uh, uh, I mean, with sertões, right? I mean, this whole thing about incorporating the interior of Brazil. I mean, this uh -huh. very uh -huh. old idea. Uh, so I, if you could develop, if you have thought about that, I mean, the genealogy of this word, classification, in this public policy. Mm -hmm. uh, and tying that to the anthropological, I mean, tradition in Brazil, I'm thinking about Antonio Carlos Santa Lima's book on the big circle of peace. That mm -hmm. uh, it is, which is about pacification, which is about mm -hmm. the, the state in pacification. So if you could develop <coughs> the idea of that. Uh, thanks for both papers. They're really great. Um, so I was struck by something that uh, you said: uh, violence gets reinscribed in the city. Um, and thinking of both papers together, uh, when uh, Professor Ralph said he's kind of cutting in between because the common narrative is within a gang, you're, you know your outcome. It's either going to be death or it's going to be incarceration. But actually, there's another outcome, right, which is living with a disability uh, for the rest of your life. Um, and so uh, thinking uh, through in, in Death in gangs too often that gets re like the city gets reinscribed in some way whether it's spray painting on an underpass or whatever they, they get memorialized in their in their own ways there too. Um, but uh, what I was curious about within all of this sort of re this reformation or the, ch the changing of the surface of things um, is instead of up uh, as uh, Professor Biel was. Speaking of what happens when you go down, how, how does a family get reinscribed when a family member isn't killed or sent to prison, 
which essentially takes them permanently out of the family, but rather they take on an entirely new existence, and then how does this change the <coughs> surface of the family? I, I didn't know if you had the opportunity to get into that at all, but I'd be really interested in how the way you cut in the middle here, then how that's how that reconstitutes or reshapes or resurfaces the family in some way. Can you guys handle two two more? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's first. I know there's a lot of complaints, so I'll try to try to keep it short. Um, thank you both so much for the paper. My question is actually for Lawrence, because I think this idea of dreaming is a really phenomenal way of occupying the ambiguity between corporeality and something far more ephemeral. And from my understanding, you're using that in a sense of kind of aspirational dreaming. And I guess I'm wondering how your analysis might shift if instead of using the analytic in the sense of aspiration, you think of it in terms of dreaming like what happens at night. Um, because I, I was thinking about that in the sense of a way of preserving some of the indeterminacy and living in that ambiguous space that you describe. Because you can't really account for what happens next in the plot point of a dream. And I was wondering how your interlocutors account for how their lives go through. So I was thinking it was Mr. Otis who was describing the transition from politics to violence. What, how does he account for that transition? Or what? how do your interlocutors imagine how city government is create, creating categories that forecloses the perfectly good house. Thank you very much for your papers. Uh, I had a question for Mariana, but uh, uh, Professor, uh, but uh, it also relates to some of Professor Ralph's uh, themes. Uh, I'm curious with uh, speaking of this question of, of isolation and of of the uh, the young citizen who is both uh, nebulously either very dangerous or very vulnerable, um, and I'm and I'm curious uh, the, the the with with the kind of uh, at least the speculation of of, of a uh, in, incoming sort of uh, middle class uh, or kind of uh, consumption culture an increase in that kind of idea where where young people uh, kind of are are now uh, Entering uh, visible public areas um, in order to kind of they, they want a piece of, of whatever it is that consumption culture is, is here is, is bringing um, and I'm thinking it particularly in context of the phenomena of the rodeziños, um, which are these flash flash mobs um, uh, of people from favelas taking over malls um, to just be there in a very social uh, somewhat festive environment and how that uh, destabilizes this. This kind of trope of of uh, of, of, of what, what Professor Ralph was saying, isolation uh, with a, with a danger of contagion, or like that kind of seeping out into it. Um, and, and and I would I would also be curious to hear your comments about the Cracolandias, which are also kind of uh, a space occupied in the city of crack users that also disrupt that kind of s separation of of uh, domains. Looks like you guys have room for more notes for one more question, so Max. <laughs> <laughs> for notes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The answer. I can write down. <laughs> it's for Mariana, and it's, this could be off topic or not, but um, I wonder if you ever thought about what extent this um, pacification of urbanism includes this, what I think is absolutely horrible and crazy, this uh, tourism that is being made in favelas. Um, which to me makes no sense, but it's being embraced by nonsense people that will there pay for it. So is this part of this pacification, or pas pacification urbanism, or this is just crazy? You guys each have three minutes. Good, because if I had more time, I'd actually have to answer everything, right? No, we have, we're, 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 we're yeah. good time. Yeah. Okay, um, let me see if I can put some of these together. There's one more. There's wrong, wrong and like very difficult questions. You were afraid in Chicago, I thought. Okay, um, no, I think, uh, yeah, it, let's do this as, as I can. Um, first thing is that. I think that uh, I may not have made it that I may not have made as clear like what what I see what I perceive as a break right now. I mean, 
when I was talking about favela consolidation, I was talking about how people built their houses and they invested in the, in the space of the favela and how, you know, progressively over time, favelas consolidate, right? Um, that, that was what I was working on in my dissertation, which is completely this pre-UPP world, which, because I, I think there's a distinct regime of visibility that sort of um, crowns this whole uh, um, rise of the classes say it. And it's like one day we wake up and we're in a completely different country from what we're used to describing. Like, it's like things have been changing, I'd say, for the past 15 to 20 years, but then at a certain moment, it's just so obvious in public uh, um, discourse also changes and these images of the favelas also change. And we look at public space and you have all these people from the favela speaking for the favela, right? But I think that, and I, I, I mean, I just spent um, January trying to write an introduction to this ethnography, right? Uh, to this early ethnography that I did uh, um, up until 2007. And what I decided was that I, I, it took me so long to actually get this book out because I didn't have a tense from which to tell the story of favela consolidation. Because I think that the UPP program and all these changes, I mean, they highlight the changes, right? And much research these days goes into the favela scene, oh, what's changed here? So let's have a look at what's so different from what it was before. But when I was doing my research back in 2006, what I, I, what I found was that there was a very um, dynamic real estate market in the favelas already. I mean, I've done research on this. It was like, it, there was something really interesting going on before the whole pacification effort was that for decades on end, the favelas improved their material infrastructure. They had better access to services. Everything sort of got better in the favela, except for the violence, right? Nightly shootouts and all that. In terms of the city, something very interesting came out of this because the real estate market in the favelas was so valued. But the real estate market on the border of the favelas had plummeted in value. So what I started to see were that people were moving out from the favela into buildings that directly faced them because the buildings in the so-called formal city were so devalued that you know you create this passage. So it's, but then when you, when you look at the way the story is getting told these days, it's as if the UPP came in and the market came in and everything has changed overnight. So what I'm, what I'm really interested in is in how these are long processes that developed over time, right? But the narrative is of these radical breaks, because there is a radical break once you don't have shootouts every night, like it was in the place where I used to do my, re my, my research, right? So then you have these people, all, all of them, that actually moved out into the formal city, and these people actually did great business, right? Because for a while there, an apartment in, on the side of the favela cost 30,000 reais, Right, right face in the favela, and a house in the favela also cost 30,000 cash. The minute there were rumors that the UPP was going to be set out there, the apartment facing the favela, its market value went up to 60,000 cash. And I had a student go there the other day and have a look at how much they were going for 125. So the people who actually did this in time, they, they sort of like changed their, you know, they, they changed their social class, right? Because they now have an actual asset. Well, we don't know how long this is going to go on for, but I just wanted to uh, um, I wanted to highlight that a lot of what we're talking about now as a result of the UPP was already going on. The market was already in the favela. I mean, capitalists are very good at finding markets. So the question also becomes like um, how uh, um, how the favela comes to uh, how how the UPP actually helps the favela realize its market potential, which is what we see these days, right? Residents joke that the sky, the the cable TV, uh, um, the, the cable TV store comes it comes up in, in the boppy car, right? So it's like you know the 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 comparão do boppy, né? As casas vêm comparão do boppy. What does that mean? It's, no, so it's like the military come in, but the market also comes in, and the sense that people get is precisely that. Uh, okay, so. The police were in, they were already here. So we brought guns like we did before. The market's here, we sort of had the market before. Where are the services where, that people have been promising us? So that seems to keep lagging behind. Um, wait, you had, so I mean, what, what are people gaining? It, it's, it's very ambiguous, right? And I think, I think that's what's so interesting about this because it's, it is a very strange trade-off, and at the same time, you do have this uh, threat of white removal, right? Uh, or um, 
Okay. City, state, federal government. So here, again, it's, it's this is really hard, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that. <laughs> no, it's, it's just that I think that what I've said actually helps me answer other questions, like for instance, what Massa was saying, the, the favela tours also preceded the UPP program, but again, the UPP program seems to really be helpful to the situation that was on the ground before. Um, I have a colleague, Bianca Freire Medeiros, who has written on the favela tours, and it's actually very interesting when you, when you do ethnographic research in these areas, because one of the things that she found was that, you know, the tourists are watching the favelados, but the favelados are also watching the tourists. They, make, they have so much fun, you know, making fun of the tourists, and they have such a sense of humor about it. And that they're very critical towards it, too, you know. They know that, uh, um, you know, and they can differentiate, right, uh, what are really, really community uh, um, tours, because you've got thousands of these all over the place. And then you've got things like the Teleferico and the Alemão, that, that are also attracting hordes of tourists, right? It's very visible and everything. So it's, but still, uh, when we're talking about isolation, if you have flows of tourists, that's also a difference, right? You know, and, and, and I mean, again, there's going to be people who are going to see gain in that. And I, I just think, I just think that's what's so interesting about all this is that it's really it, it does away with this idea of the favela as a sociological category. The favela today is a native category, and it's very disputed on the ground, right? Because, for instance, you have residents of former housing projects that want to claim the status of favela because then they have the right to more investments, right? They, you know, they're eligible for more funding for social programs and all that. So I think this is very interesting, the way it, at the same time it blurs, you know, the favela asphalt boundary, but at the same time it reinforces it. Right, because there's all this noise and all this talk about what is a favela and what, what not just spatially but politically and, and who gets to speak for it. So I think it, it's a very interesting arena to look at political struggles as as they are happening. Um, and this goes back yet, Huangdong, Ustedoings, and the narrative is that the, the overarching narrative, the, the narrative that legitimizes the pacification program, that legitimizes all this, is a narrative of the entrance of the state. That's why I made a point of saying that Malvinus is the result of state interventions from day one. Because uh, it's it, it, this whole idea, what, what's, a, what's a commonsensical narrative, right? Um, the state was absent from the favelas for so long, and then the drug trade came in and, and, and sort of took over the vacuum of the state. And we know from historical research that people like Brody Fisher, for instance, has been doing that uh, there's so many people in the middle class that have made so much money off of other real estate markets, you know, since the beginning of the century, that, you know, th this does seem to be a, a, a very, a, a narrative that reinforces the status quo. And more than that, you know, it, it fits very nicely with what Max L. H. has called the metaphor of war, right? For so, for a very long time, the favelas got constructed as this um, this space, uh, 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 like this idea that there's a war going on in the city, right? That it makes it very easy to legitimize in the public sphere that the police go into the favelas and shoot people randomly, you know, based usually on the color of the skin and their age. So, uh, 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 so what I'm saying is that this whole idea of the of the entrance of the state, right? The, the state always enters, right, the military force. And, and so I think that, yes, it's very similar to a lot that we've seen before. But when we look at, when, when we actually look at the practices, when we look at the history of these areas, the state has always been there, like, be it uh, uh, um, in many guises, right? But the state has shaped the concept, like, well, like what you said, right? But the pastor sort of created the conditions for the favelas to proliferate. Um, okay, okay, now to get back to drums, very difficult question. Just wanted to say one thing to Alison when you were talking about Jane Jacobs and Robert Moses. The first time I started to write about this, I was talking about how actually uh, uh, the Favela Bay, which was a previous organization program, was Jane Jacobs, you know, because it did small interventions, you know, that were on the community level, and then the backy works and everything that came afterwards is Robert Moses, you know, it just tears down the limiters. So I think uh, um, Jane Jacobs won, and I mean, you can hear architects saying that Jane Jacobs won, but it's Robert Moses that is 
shaping um, the Olympic Rio, right? Which is really sad. And uh, just to get back to Jean then, to this difficult question about all levels of government, one of the things that has been said very often about the UPP program was that, and these changes, is that it depended on this alignment, right? Between, because for a very long time, there's never, there's never a moment in which the federal government, the state government, and the city government were aligned, right? For a very long time, the, you know, there were all these political fights and oppositions, and you know, so people could go around blaming each other for, you know, the shortcomings of public policy, and but that is also part of how things play out. Because if you take, for instance, the the provision of security, so the UPP program is an attribution of the state government of Rio, but it's the city hall that can, can go in the city, or it's the municipality that can go in, like providing services, like most of the health services provisions and, 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 and you know, schools, um, right? And so there's, uh, uh, um, what, what I want to say is that if you look at what happened, for instance, at the UPP Social, so for, uh, in the beginning, it was just the UPP program. And then according to demands of favela residents and everything, uh, there was this idea, okay, so we need to follow the military occupation with the social occupation. But the social occupation had to it had to uh, sort of coordinate both levels of government, right? The, the the municipality and the state government, and then it fails because it's very difficult to coordinate all this. And I mean, I, I, I've done research. I've done research and work at the city hall. That uh, and I mean, I'd go in as secretary of education, as the municipal secretary of housing, and I get to the favela where I'm supposed to do an urbanistic program. And there was the Secretary of so the Public Works Secretariat was already there, like drilling holes in the ground. So I think that this uh, uh, um, this coordination between three levels of government is even more difficult if it's already hard enough, you know. And, and this has to, you know, uh, uh, the way these uh, the way the state has, has structured itself over time. So I've already spoken too much. <laughs> I could talk for another hour. <laughs> All right, well, I guess I'll start by answering the, the, the who benefits question, too, because I think it's interesting, uh, particularly in relationship to redevelopment. So, um, so when I was doing research, the kind of proposal on the table was to make Eastwood what they call a TIF district or a tax increment financing district. And then what that basically means is that the government is going to front money for redevelopment um, and with the idea that once redevelopment begins, there will be increased tax revenues, right? And they will use the, the tax increment to pay themselves back, right? So basically they need to raise taxes in order to pay themselves back. So residents look at that with skepticism because they know that they'll eventually be priced out of the community. And I think that has to do with the kind of larger question of scaling up, right? Because it's, in terms of the, it has to do with the question of what's the institutional logic behind these practices that are experienced as injur injurious, right? And so when an assumption is being made that the residents who live there don't have don't need to have input, shouldn't have input, or they're not going to benefit from the change. I think that is regarded as injurious. But there could be another institutional logic at work, which is that uh, the program, we're going to work with you on a program, in other words, and it, it can benefit the community itself. And I, I think when that happens, it's not experienced as an injury in the social sense, right? And so the church is a good example of this because they straddle both sides of the, the, the debate and the fence, right? So on the one hand, the big church in the community has a redevelopment wing, and they redevelop homes in the, the neighborhood, and they're kind of, they're for the redevelopment plan. And so there's a kind of institutional nexus that has to do with the government, the kind of local nonprofits, especially the church, and kind of economic in investors who stand to benefit from redevelopment, even though residents don't agree with it. And then on the other hand, the church 
has a lot of social welfare programs like that re rehabilitation center. They do work around HIV and AIDS. They do violence prevention, so a lot of gang members circulate through their doors. So people have a kind of fraught relationship to the church. And you know, on the one hand, when it comes to issues of redevelopment, people say some things like, well, they want, they, they surely have this rehabilitation center, but I want to know when my grandson is recovered, will he have a place to come home to, right? On the one hand, on the other hand, they're glad that their grandson is in the rehabilitation center, right? They know that they need that. And, and the way that recovery works and the way that HIV um, uh, prevention works is that the church, I think they are really good at not having a imposing even a Christian uh, uh, worldview onto the people who they help, right? I think from their perspective, they use, they use might be the wrong word, but they, the people who they work with, they know that they're, those people are valuable to the community because they help make their mission commensurate to the problem with the problems of the community itself and so they don't need to like laminate a redemption narrative onto somebody's speech about having hiv they let the person with hiv talk about their hardships and they let the person with hiv talk about how they experience their injuries and that becomes a collective thing about how to heal and a kind of collective narrative that can be recuperated into a redemption paradigm, but doesn't have to be. And so I think the kind of larger institutional mission, when you, when you think about goals, I think it's, it, the, they're most commensurate when things like that happen, when there's a kind of synergy between how the residents themselves are experiencing injury and how the institution incorporates that or allows a space for that as well, because there's not really many spaces um, with kind of lack of health care, with, with a lot of things. There's not a lot of institutional settings for people to actually articulate, testify to their experiences of injury. And the church becomes a, a good site for that, right? And so I think institutions can work in that way in, a, in, in providing a venue for people to talk about injury and, and, and having it be a kind of collective thing. It's not. In, in that setting, it's not about an individual responsibility. It's a kind of a collective communal responsibility, a discourse about how everybody is pulling from these threads and uh, kind of thinking about healing in a collective way. Right? Um, the second question about families, I think that's a disability has a lot to do with that, um, but because of caregiving and the structure of caregiving. And so oftentimes you see the kind of family in a new light. And actually that's what drew, drew me to the, the idea of disability because, you know, when you're doing gang research, it's hard to say like, oh, can I talk to your mother about you being in the gang, or can I talk to you? <laughs> your sister is even worse so about you being in the gang. So when you think about disability and how people, and how relationships get dis reconfigured after disability and how people talk about the shame and guilt and you know, my mother always told me that this would happen and now she's the one that's helping me get out of bed, she's the one that's feeding me. And so those, you really see the kind of way that the kind of family structure has been rebuilt. And on a broader sense, it has to do with other ideas of injury as well, and ideas of, again, this idea of contagion, because the, the narrative that, people are very critical of the narrative that gang violence should justify X, whether it's redevelopment, whether it's something else, because you know the people in the gang are also their sons and grandsons and granddaughters. And so there are many times when I, I've heard myself, um, people, people tell me, oh, 
well, what they will ask me what kind of research I'm doing. I tell them oh, I'm interested in how the gang is responding to this. I'm just saying now the gang is dealing with that. And people say, you know, well, those people who you study, they're not gang members to us. They are grandbabies. So they're not, you know. So, and, and they're not, and, and so they mean they're not merely gang members, in other words. And, and sometimes they are, uh, they will talk about the violence of the gang and the problems of the gang, but other times they will talk about it as a kind of notion of family, a notion of kinship, and it, it often depends on the perspective of the orientation of who they presume they're talking to, right? Um, and the final question about dreaming, I think dreaming in that sense only really explicitly came up one one time or one time I can really remember when a, you know there's a lot of when you tell me like you're writing a dissertation you're writing a book other people are have writing projects in the neighborhood and they're writing memoirs about the gang and their experience in the gang as well and so you know I always thought those were good opportunities to talk about people and get their perspectives and one person in particular was a disabled gang member named Tosh who was writing a kind of memoir about his experience in the gang and it was called Trapped and so I was asking him about I guess not so subtly trying to ask him about disability because he never wanted to talk about his disability and so I so I thought it was an opportunity so I'm asking him is this kind of title Trapped about your disability and he's like, of course it is, man, but I don't want, I don't want to talk about that with you, right? And he's just telling me what else the game, what else the book was about. And, but he told me that, the most he said was that it ended in a dream. And he said that in the dream, he's in the hospital bed after the doctor told him that he's not going to be able to walk. And he gets out of the bed and he just starts walking out of the hospital. And, and he's just walking and when he hits the door, he wakes up and then he, he realizes he's disabled and and I think that you know if I look at dreaming through the way that you challenged me to look at it I think it has to do with that tension between um, having an aspiration and meeting the reality of that, that aspiration and it also has to do with erasure because if you take someone like Mr. Otis he has this notion of the gang, of a political gang. But even his notion of a political gang is, it's what the gang are, uh, did, but it's romantic. So he doesn't talk about the criminal activities that the gang did back then. He doesn't talk about um, the fact that it wasn't just a civil rights political, but also like a Black Panther political that was feared because of his revolutionary potential. Like all of that's cleansed. And so there's things that, that are erased there and, that, and that image of the gang, the clean political image of the gang, puts pressure on the youngest members now because they can't live up to that. Structurally, they can't live up to that. Like, they can't get grants in the same way that the old generation got grants to do the same community and service initiatives that they did, right? And in a similar way, the, a similar way as somebody like Mr. Smalls, kind of erases particular histories of the neighborhood, particular histories of what people can and can't do as if it's a, as if it's a individual thing, right? And not taking into account the wider kind of social implications of why <coughs> people are in particular communities and why the statistics look the way they do, right? And so I think it's about having an aspiration, but be, being also confronted with that reality in both senses of the word dreaming, even when you think about um, the kind of subconscious Freudian dreams. There's more questions. Just a real quick comment. <laughs> yeah. This is actually uh, just a quick response also to your uh, Shaw's question about the looking at the level of the financing and who's 
investing. And I was struck by the phrase um, that uh, you quoted from Mr. Smalls, where he basically said, um, the residents simply don't have the resources, and thus there's the need for intervention and redevelopment. And I think maybe that concept of resources <laughs> It, it helps bridge in a way from the dream, the, the, the what you're embodying yeah. with the dreaming, to the, that kind of hard question of you know where's the money going, where's the money coming from, whether you know who who says that residents should have the re, you know what does that mean to to challenge that residents have resources. I mean, yes, they don't have the, the money that the city or the state would use to tear down the neighborhood. They, they, don't, they don't have that kind of resources, but somebody has resources through which they're thinking about the neighborhood. Um, and, and it yeah. strikes me that there's a, a language there, and very interesting that he used that language of resources in that, in that way. Um, thank you so, so much for um, your presentations. I had a question for Professor Ralph. Um, so you talked a lot about the really powerful ways that the wounded ex-gang mem members are able to intervene and to really come up from a place of like probably previous voicelessness to empower at the individual level the people and the young, the young people in their communities. But I was wondering what your thoughts are on their capacity or there being any type of platform for them to intervene on these structural levels, as in like the types of policies that put them in the position to enter the gangs, the economic limitations that are in these communities that lead people to go into drugs, like all of these things, it seems like their voices are really at the table for policymakers in general or for the people that are making institutional level decisions. And so I, I didn't know if you saw any of that or if there's capacity for that or what the limitations of something like that would be. Let's go to the first. Just uh, uh, thank you very much for wonderful presentations and comments too. Uh, uh, words, again, uh, uh, I was uh, really struck and found it very interesting, isolation. And isolation as a medicalized metaphor that was mentioned by you and others. But uh, the question of dreams too, and I thought that isolation, uh, the root of isolation is uh, insula, islands, and therefore also utopias and dreams. And I was thinking that uh, there is in the presentation in both actually, uh, uh, but more so in relation to the gangs in Chicago. The, the, I think the notion, the very strong ethical urge for renewal and rebirth, uh, which has to do with uh, utopia and and I think a tradition of thought uh, that carries out of weight from that word, isolation, and the root of the insula and utopia. And I find that uh, very uh, uh, illuminating too, that isolation can lead to renewal and can lead to rebirth of a community, or at least that might be the dream for some. You could maybe add with that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he's still going to answer questions. Well, I'll, I'll answer my question that I've been answering. Hallway, but yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think on the kind of question of structural change, I mean, I think that generally speaking, uh, I, I think I'm, I'm trying to make an argument that these narratives matter, uh, whether they're from gang members themselves or from people who are involved in redevelopment or um, HIV or drug addicts. Um, I think that I think that those stories can matter on a structural level um, in the sense that I think that, and part of the reason why I'm interested in distilling it down to people like Mr. Smalls is because I, I'm, I want to kind of understand the logic and the presumptions that they're making to inform their kind of policies. And so whether it's this notion of resources, right? Or so the question is, 
uh, that Allison brings up is like, why can't human beings be regarded as a kind of resource, right? And that just flips on its head the notion that you need to reconfigure the community in a particular way without the residents, right? And I think that and with the gang members, especially the ones that have been injured, they're saying a similar thing about violence and what it means and how it can reconfigure relationships within the gang and relationships within the community. And I think that has an impact on a structural level for how we think about what we should do with gang members or what should, what should we do with the kind of institution like the gang that has an entrenched history in the community, right? And the possibility for its transformation or, or not. And I think that leads to the second question. I mean, which, it, I mean, I think there's something, you, you definitely utopic in this idea of dreams and, and people have different versions of what that utopian dream should look like. Like Mr. Otis has one particular idea of dreaming that's different from Justin. But I think the kind of least common denominator is this idea of re renewal and the kind of um, transforming injury, reimagining what injury could mean in a particular context to affect um, the future of the community, future of um, the gang, and the future of different institutions within the neighborhood. And so I think at its core, um, the, the utopian impulse that's embedded in dreaming has to do with the kind of transformation, right? And, and, and a transformation that is felt at the bodily level oftentimes, but affects people's social outlooks. Okay, just really quickly, because it also relates to this idea of, of isolation. Actually, when I didn't answer Joan's questions, because I wanted to get to yours, when I was talking about the favela being in this native category and so many people speaking for it, I think that the whole zines are, I think, one of the most interesting things that happened recently because it's, you know, it's these kids from the periphery actually um, acting upon what they perceive as they're being stereotyped for so long by so many people. So just their mere presence is, uh, uh, it just uh, sort of, it destabilizes, right? Long-standing hierarchies and certainties and structured Brazilian inequality on such an everyday level that, you know, uh, um, just their being there is just so amazing and it's so revealing, I think, of all these transformations that, you know, uh, um, seem so incredibly visible now but have been going on over time. And, well, the Cracolandia, we can talk, I, I think we can talk about that in, 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 in the court and, in, I mean, in over coffee, but I just wrote an article about that and I think it's just very interesting how, uh, uh, the Cracolangio, for instance, in Sao Paulo has a very distinct territoriality from the ones in Rio, right? The ones in Rio tend to migrate that in a way that has very that responds to the UPP geography. So I had a, for instance, a student from Colombia that was uh, doing research on my supervision. She was doing research in Alemão. The day the occupation happened, her field site was gone. She had to move to Manguinhos. And if she'd been in Manguinhos when Manguinhos got pacified, she'd have to move to Avenida Brasil. So it's like, it's pushing away. I, I think the Cacolandas actually make it so visible how these processes that were in the city core are getting pushed out and getting reformed in, in the fringes and in the periphery of the city. Uh, just wanted to, I think this was a sign of that. Uh, it was very hard to be a moderate moderator in the session. It was, you guys yes, touched on, <laughs> you touched on such a, you know, so many of our key things in such beautiful, powerful ways that I, I kept wanting to, to, to jump in. But on the other hand, it was really just as stimulating to hear uh, the comments. So, so on that note, this is a, a wonderful way to reach to uh, keep the conversation going outside. We'll have a uh, reception. The next talk will be uh, equally unmissable. So. See you soon, both 16 for 30. Thank you, beautiful.